Rick and I go back a long way. We're very, very close friends, and we worked together for a long time. He is younger than me, yes. um, just, but both of us really got to know about the Toronto blessing, and we're blasted, and we have never been the same since. That's right. We're a lot better, so let's welcome Rick Oldman, please. Could you please? Wow. So... It's totally legal to soak in my session, okay? Some of you know what I'm saying. So if you, if you want to just stay in the spirit and just uh, come into the river with me now, come into the presence where all the joy is, where all of the, the heavenly manner is, where, where the breakthroughs are, it's with him. It's in the, it is in worship. It is in adoration and worship. That's where we find the breakthroughs. There is an ease in the anointing, isn't there? Do we know this? There are times when it just comes together and it's not coincidence. It is the breaking out of the Lord's presence. It's the breaking through of his glory into the things that he desires the most. And guys, if we're going to see this country change, then we're going to need to stay in the river of his presence. We're going to need to stay where he is because where he is, everything lives. He is the river. And, you know, this is just my exhortation to soak in this session, all right? Just, just say, Holy Spirit, give me another drink right now. Give me another uh, impartation of, of the wine of heaven, the joy of it all. Um, <clears throat> I've joking, I currently live in Blackpool. I was brought up in Blackpool. Um, up until the age of 20, I didn't go to church, didn't know anything about Christianity, didn't know anything about anything other than uh, having fun, doing dangerous stuff, and making lots of money. And we, my family, we owned video arcades. Does that ring a bell? You know what I'm talking about? Amusement arcades. So anyone heard of the Pleasure Beach? Okay, Southport, Blackpool, Morecambe, there were Pleasure Beaches. We owned amusement arcades. When I was a kid, kids used to play with Lego, and I used to stack up money and build things out of it. And, you know, so I grew up very materialistic um, in a world where, you know, there was just no room, no idea of God. And one day, and I brought it out of the hotel, I found one of these which had been thrown away, uh, a Gideon's Bible. And I read it. And I used to hide it under my bed. You know how teenage boys hide things that they're reading under their beds in case mum comes in the room well I had one of these stuffed under my bed and if I heard mum coming up the stairs I'd quickly hide it under the bed in the hope she wouldn't find it and it was a new testament and I found something in that in that new testament what I found was a person and that person of course is Jesus I knew nothing about him about the only thing that I knew was that some of the words I were reading were in common use, like man cannot live by bread alone. Talk to an entrepreneur like my dad and he'll tell you often, man can't live by bread alone, but by, you know, the sweat of your brow. And I realized there was a different version of that, that it was by every word that came from the mouth of God. And so I started to, to find this person, Jesus, and you're probably aware that there, there are very many different kinds of lifestyles out there. And I want to go to one of these parades one day and stand up, you know, when it's testimony time and say, I'm in love with a man. <laughs> and he saved me. And he loves me. And his name is Jesus. And, and so I started by falling in love with this person, Jesus. And to a, to a young guy who, was, who used to like to do dangerous things, risky things, you know, I found somebody who I can love, who I can admire and I can follow. Let me tell you what, girls, what guy love looks like, bromance. This is a bromance for you. Psalm 45. My heart is stirred by a noble theme. I recite my verses for the king. My tongue is the pen of a skillful writer. And then here it is, the bromance, verse two. You are the most excellent of men. 
Your lips have been anointed with grace since God has blessed you forever. Gird up your sword on your side, O mighty one. Clothe yourself with splendor and majesty. In your majesty, ride forth victoriously on behalf of truth, humility and righteousness. Let your hand display awesome deeds. Let your sharp arrows pierce the hearts of the king's enemies. Let the nations fall beneath your feet. Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever and the scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. All your robes are fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia from the palaces adorned with ivory. The music of stringed instruments makes you glad. Daughters of kings are among your honored women. There are daughters of the king in the room. You are among the honored women. At your right hand is the royal bride in gold of Ophir. Listen, O daughter, consider and give ear. Forget the people of your father's house. The king is enthralled with your beauty. Honor him, for he is your Lord. The daughter of Tyre will come with a gift. Men of wealth will seek your favor. All glorious is the princess within her chamber. Her gown is interwoven with gold. It is embroidered with garments. Think of this as the bride of Christ. And all of the testimonies of the saints and all of the deeds of the saints and the young men and the young women and the the ones who will do what we're doing, giving our lives away. All of that sewn into the bridal gown for the wedding supper of the Lamb. And there'll be a part of that wedding garment as the bride of Christ is led into his presence and you'll say, I embroidered that. I put that on the dress. So I grew up with this Jesus that I found in this book. I didn't know anything about church. We, my girlfriend and I, who sat down there, um, we used to go out to nightclubs and we'd stay out till two in the morning, four in the morning. We'd get up next day, go to work, do the same thing the next night, stay out till 4 a.m., get up, go to work. That was the life we knew. So when we got saved we came into this really, 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 really traditional, I mean like, you know, museum piece Methodist church. And we went from being, you know, happy clubbers, doing the the whole dad dance thing and everything, you know, that was me. Uh, We went from that to stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down. And we absolutely loved it. Because we were so enthralled and so happy with the most excellent of men. We thought, well, if this is what you've got to do, this is fine by us. And the reason for that is because we'd never been to church. We'd not been trained in unbelief. And we'd never been trained that there are aspects of the church that are uncool. We thought this was the best thing ever. In fact, for the first two weeks when we became Christians at the Billy Graham meetings in Liverpool, which were so full we didn't get in, we watched it on a screen outside, It felt like we were walking on air. We were in love with the Savior. And we felt foolish about it because now the the book that I'd hidden under the bed had to come out. They told us that somebody from the church would call at home to visit us and oh no, my mum's going to meet the vicar and he's going to say, you know, where's this this young lad? And mum's going to say, what, him? But we fell in love with a saviour. And, you know, we just had an Irish team through the doors in Blackpool with us. You may or may not know, Blackpool's one of the poorest places in the UK. Of, um, in terms of deprivation and need, uh, of the top 10 poorest wards in the United Kingdom, five are in the centre of Blackpool. And uh, infant mortality, child, um, child prostitution, drug taking, criminal activity, highest teenage pregnancy rate in Europe, 3,000 HIV AIDS. It just goes on and on and on because what's happened to Blackpool in the shifting of seaside economies, same for Brighton and other places, is that the inner cities have sent their inner cities to the seaside on a permanent holiday. And when we lived in London, in, in, in West London, Planting Church, which Sam and Grace now lead, 
I remember that when people would come through domestic violence and present themselves homeless into the council, and the council would say, well, we've nothing for you, but we can put you on a bus and we can send you to Blackpool. And so if you come to the centre of Blackpool, you'll find most of the accents of the United Kingdom other than the local ones. And so what I want to do just for my little time with you is talk about how this Jesus who I discovered, and I keep finding him in this book, it's like amazing. He talks to you. He appears to you. This Jesus that I love, I want to talk about him for a little while if that's okay with you. Because he, he's, he's the motivation for everything. You know, some people... Not today, because I'm nice and steady. But, you know, I have been likened to Tigger out of the, the Winnie the Pooh stories. Put me in a room where there's an opportunity for the gospel and I'm, like, bouncing. I want it. Not, I was looking at Will this morning and thinking, Will, that's what I'm like at home. <laughs> you know, but I just want to share some stuff with you today. This conference is called Compelled by Love. And I want you just to think for a moment about one of my favorite go-to things as a child which is a catapult and it was either a, a catapult or who remembers chewing up paper and you know firing it anyone throw paper on the ceiling when the teacher was writing on the board or was that just me some of us do that come on oh no want to see some hands yeah one or two of us okay you know what I'm talking about well imagine you have a bow and arrow or a catapult and I, and I want to fire an arrow at you right now so what I do is I pull the bow back this much I just pull it back to there and I say right I'm going to get you now and I let go and the arrow goes Ugh. okay that didn't work let's try again pull it back a bit further and maybe you know we hit in the middle of the floor but I'm aiming for the back of the room I was told to preach to the back of the room when I was uh, learning this stuff but here's the deal how much you love depends on how much you've been pulled into the love of God. How much you've had a revelation of this man who's the most excellent of men. This one who rides out in righteousness and justice and peace. This one who raises the dead, heals the sick, causes the blind eyes to be opened. This one who touched the leper first. Even before Heidi kissed the leper, Jesus touched the leper. I know you're shocked by that, but Jesus is the author of all of those things. And in the creation of the cosmos, where God created this small space called the cosmos, in order to create us, in order to have relationship with us, in order to reveal, I am the Lord. I am Yahweh gracious and compassionate, slow to get angry, quick to forgive, who will have mercy. He created a cosmos in order to show us love. And as we look at that, as we have the encounter, and worship is so very often where we have the encounter, the Holy Spirit will meet you in that moment and he will lift you and seat you with Christ in heavenly places right there. And you will have, I dare, I'll put it like this, an impartation of the love of God. You see, I once sat next to a well-known person talking about an evangelistic campaign for the UK. That person was Reinhard Bonnke. And as I sat next to him, it's like the guy was radioactive. <laughs> Truly. I felt faith coming off the guy. I don't, Heidi's nodding, but he has beyond anything I have seen, a gift of faith. And I sat in a, in a, in a, in a, a hotel in London and we were talking about a, something called minus to plus, if anyone remembers that. And, and as I sat next to this guy, I am receiving an impartation of faith. It taught me something before Toronto about the power of impartation. And then... When I went to Toronto, you see, we'd already had in my local church in Lytham St. Anne's, we'd had a guy called Lonnie Frisbee, we'd had a guy called John Wimber, Blaine Cook, all of those people came to, to our church in, in, in the north in 1980s. So when I went to Toronto, the manifestations looked like my home church, where we got saved. I thought, I know what this is. And, and, but what I got from that encounter was another impartation called peace. The gift of peace. And I want to tell you that when the Holy Spirit is moving in power, he will, he will impart something to you. 
there will be something given to you in the encounter that is yours to keep. And there will be things for you during these times in the worship, whether it's a revelation, whether it's um, an impartation of the fruit of the Spirit or a gift of the Spirit, you will receive power. You will receive from on high in those encounters. And let me tell you, what you receive, you get to keep. That's really important because the devil wants to tell you for any number of legalistic reasons, what you receive from heaven, he can take from you. That it's no longer yours. That you are Ichabod. That you've been thrown away. I don't believe that. I can't believe that. It's not the Jesus I know and found and fell in love with in the New Testament who said, I will never leave you or forsake you. I'll never lose any of those that the Father has placed into my hand. I have had that revelation and encounter that has secured me on a rock with an anchor. I am tied to him because he is tied to me. You see, you can't give away what you have not received as an impartation. If you have only received an intellectual thing, then you will give away this Jesus whom Paul preaches, or this Jesus whom Paul teaches, or Rick teaches. You need your own encounters with him. You need to find him in the secret place. And if you will, that will absolutely change you forever. I found that Jesus in this book. I found the descriptors of him here, but I met him in the spirit. When I first got saved, I used to go, I didn't realize that this wasn't usual but I used to have dreams and go to heaven and I would find places that are written in the book of Revelation and have those same visions so when I was learning to read the Bible I found the places that I'd already seen I found Isaiah 40 the place where you go up the mountain and blow the trumpet and call people to worship when I went to the Wimber healing meetings uh, they said okay guys everyone's you need, if you're going to do the healing thing, you need um, words of knowledge. So we're just going to give you words of knowledge now. Is that okay? And we all went, yeah, okay. And so they said, everyone stand up. And, uh, and we all stood up dutifully. And they said, in the name of Jesus, receive words of knowledge. Now go and try it out. And uh, so, you know, we, we, we had a go. And I thought, well, okay, Lord, I'm not seeing much. What... Um, and all I got was a guy with a finger missing and a blind eye. Seemed a bit odd. So, there's, so I'm fumbling around, <laughs> thinking, what do I do with this? And, and then, you know, the, the, the word come, okay, go and find someone to pray with and, and pray healing for them. And there's me and this guy left, stood there in the aisle. And uh, so I said, hi, my name's Rick. And I can't remember his name. And said, so what's up with you? And, you know, rubs his, rubs his cheek and says, well, when I was a kid, I got a rose bush in my eye. And I don't see out of it. So I didn't work for that. I didn't have to sweat for it. I didn't particularly need a conference. I just needed someone who was a carrier to give me their radioactive contagion. And I believe God because it's in the word that that's what we do. So baby faith is what was mentioned to you this morning and that's the walking on water stuff. Okay, everybody who's a believer in Jesus, can do the stuff we're me not meant to do because it's not us doing it. If Jesus wants you to walk on water or heal the sick or raise the dead, you don't need a course for that. Okay, it's the Holy Spirit in you, the hope of glory that works through you that gives you that to do. That's not the issue. You can learn more and more about this Jesus. You can fill in the blanks on his face, his identity, his ways. You can, you know, Scripture's amazing for teaching us the ways of God. But to do the miracles of God, it comes with the deal, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Be baptized. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you, plunge you in, drown you and lose you in the Holy Spirit. Again, you know, maybe, maybe it's just his way, but Reinhard Bonnke says the anointing's not like a discharging battery that you need to keep recharging. When you receive the Holy Spirit, you receive the Holy Spirit. God with us, Emmanuel with us, the hope of glory. That may offend some of your theology who, who you feel like you need a top-up. Well, you need to remember who you are 
but the glory is the glory. Jesus is on the throne. The Spirit of God has not diminished in power over 2,000 years. He is given to the church, and we walk with him into life. Okay, so this Jesus I'm talking to you about today, and this love that compels us to do things comes I'm telling you, as an impartation and as a revelation. He wants to reveal who he is to you. And it's in the place of worship. It's in the secret place. It's in the surrendering of your heart. It's in the meditation of scripture. It's in conversation and daily life with him that you're going to find that Jesus who imparts to you something of who he is. He will reveal to you his love. And I just want to take us in the, in the short time that I've got left to three places. Number one, is to the alabaster jar. I was so pleased that that's where we started in our songs because that's all God's given me to tell you is about the alabaster jar. Is it, pause for a moment. Does anyone other than me like to look at broccoli? <laughs> I love broccoli. It's like a miniature tree, isn't it? Is it? You know, and, he, and if you look really carefully, you can see, it's, wow, this thing's got leaves. And everything, it's cool. And, and so there are ways that we look at Scripture where the more you look into them, the more detail you see. And it's like a fractal. A f you know, it just opens out and out and out and out. So when we read this story, you can read it at a top level, which is some lady comes in, she's had a real, you know, she was really touched in the meeting. She goes home, she gets her best thing. She comes into that room and she breaks open that jar and everyone's offended at her. You know, oh, we could have given that to the poor, by which Judas means I could have had a much better coat on me now if she'd have just given me that. I would have sold it, creamed some of the money off. It would have been great. But no, that idiot woman went and broke open opened her alabaster jar and gave away her inheritance. Okay, that's the surface part of the story. But if you read it again, think about it. Jesus says something absolutely remarkable in that story that's for us. This is for our heart. This is for our movement. This is for who we are. This is our DNA. When we say the words compelled by love, it, it shouldn't just ring a bell that just says, oh, I'm going to a great meeting. We should be like an arrow in, in, in the bow being pulled back and pulled back into a deeper and deeper revelation of the heart of God. And the deeper the revelation of, of the heart of God, the most excellent of men, the, that one that we want to gaze upon, the one who has all the beauty that we want to look at, who changes our lives, when we look at him and we say, Holy Spirit, show me what I'm looking at, we'll be ruined. We'll be absolutely incapable of going anywhere else. It's the story of Peter who says, where else can we go? <laughs> you you kind of get the sense of, you've tricked us. <laughs> We've seen who you are now. Well, you know, where else could we go? You have the words of eternal life. You are the Christ of God. You're the Messiah. You're the one that's been hoped for in the, all the ages. You are the most excellent of men. And later on, he would say, I'll follow you even unto death and fail. But because Jesus is the most excellent of men, he picks up the stragglers, he picks up the nobodies, he picks up the failures, he picks up the ones who need a second and a third chance because he is the most excellent of men. And this Jesus, through revelation in Scripture and in our hearts, through the Spirit of God, shows us the true nature of this passage. She comes in. She stands at the feet of Jesus who's reclining at the table. She breaks open her jar. She pours it out on the feet of Jesus. We know the story. The room is filled with aroma. Again, I just want to allow you for a moment when you read Scripture, take in the whole scene. Again, um, that was said to us this morning. Take in the whole scene. Do you ever put on a perfume and it reminds you of a holiday or triggers something? An aftershave or a perfume? You know, there you are with your old spice guys and, <laughs> you know, your brut aftershave and it reminds you of how cool you once were <laughs> in those denim jeans and the flared shirt. Awesome. The room is filled with an aroma. Christ the aroma of life is in the room. 
And God ordains an aroma to remind them of that moment. But Jesus says these remarkable words. Let's go down a layer. Leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you will always have the poor with you. He's not dismissing the poor, but he's saying there's an opportunity that will be there all the time. This one is special. The poor you will have with you all of the time, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. Remarkable words. She's done what she could. She did, or depending on your translation or the original, it says she did everything she could. She did everything she could. Key number one, she held nothing back. Everything she could do, she did. Truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed, and here we are today in August 2017, in the whole world, what she done, did will be, has done will be told in memory of her. So I pondered that one. I said, wait, 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 hang on a minute, Jesus. Pause. Could you explain that one to me? And he said, yes, it's easy. What she did was what my father did. That's why I thought it was so wonderful. You see, Every scene of scripture speaks of something in heaven. Jesus paused the room and the mayhem and drew attention to a wayward woman who found her way home. Her response became a pure response from heaven. You see, the father went and found the very best that he had. He gave everything he had in his house. The word of God is absolutely inspired here. Jesus says of that woman, she did everything she could. She has done everything she could. The father looked at the creation he had made. He looked at you and he looked at me and he said, what can I give for them? And he took his alabaster son who was to be broken open and the room was to be filled with the aroma of Christ. She has prepared for me my burial. She has anointed me prophet, priest, and king. You see, Jesus the prophet said that what was going to happen here is she would always be remembered. That's why he's a prophet. He was anointed as king because he was about to reign from the cross. And he was anointed for his burial. Prophet, priest, and king. He was the minister of a new covenant. And so as a minister, as a priest, he was anointed with oil and with fragrance. And so as we think about this word, the Father loves us because Jesus was given. And I had an encounter with that that absolutely undid me. I want to say, if you're unmoved by that, then go away and read it again. Ask the Holy Spirit to come in the room while you read it and say, Father, I want to understand your heart in this gift because this gift is the gift I want to give back to you. When that woman gave back to Jesus the gift of her alabaster jar, she was recognizing that she understood the gospel. It was, it was in the room, obvious, out of all of them there, she understood the gospel. God had given me everything in his son, so I'm going to give everything to you. So when we say, well, what does it mean to be compelled by, by love? I want the love of the Father. And we often hear that phrase in the sense of, I want to know I am loved by the Father. Well, the evidence of that is Christ died for you once and for all. Yeah. Holy Spirit bring that into our souls. I know the intention of the Father towards me. I know that he's a Father who protects me from sin and death. I know he's a Father who has provided a lamb to carry away my sin. I know that he's a Father who's preparing me to live like Jesus. Number one. Number two is God is love, the love of the Son. Another story for you. Let's look at this one. 
And again, the surface preach and read of this one is, well, you need to just give everything away, okay? It's very simple. We have an offering basket down here. Just come and give everything away. Um, last week in our Blackpool campus, we're, remember, we're ministering to the least, the last, and the lost in Blackpool. I said, you may not have money in your purse or your pocket right now, but here's the offering basket at the front. Whoever wants to come and stand in it and say, here I am, Lord, come and get in the basket. And I got in the basket, and we all did. And there was joy in the house because Jesus accepts that kind of an offering. Isn't that what God wants here? More than your money. He wants you in the offering basket. And Jesus tells, there's an account in Mark's gospel where he just comes across a guy who was a rich young ruler, and the guy runs up to Jesus, and he says, he says good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? <clears throat> Obviously, the guy was wealthy, so he's thinking about inheritances and investments. Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness, don't defraud, honor your father and mother. I've done all of these since I was a youth, Jesus. Jesus looked at him, and this is what often undoes me. He looked at him and loved him. Just an incredible statement. How many times has Jesus looked at you and just loved you? You know, when you're having a strop and a tantrum and a paddy and a panic and a, you know, uh, or you, 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 you've got yourself tangled up in something again and he just looks at you and loves you because he knows the end from the beginning. He knows how it ends for you and it ends well. Jesus looked at him and he loved him and he said, you lack one thing. Go and sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. So of course the preacher wants to tell you, go and sell everything. You know, the legalist and the, the person who's half demonized and wants to accuse you for having such a full-on faith. Well, you haven't sold everything yet, have you? Call yourself a Christian? And the fixation there is with material wealth. And the failure is to see the most excellent of men who says, I'm the rich young ruler. I'm the one who left my wealth. I'm the one who gave it all away. I'm the one serving the poor. Why don't you come and follow me and have some of my wealth and my inheritance? You see, we fixate on the lad who was there talking to Jesus when actually the real rich young ruler is Christ himself. He's the one who, we're told in Philippians, emptied himself and became nothing, taking on the, the identity of a servant even unto death on the cross. Therefore, God has taken him and raised him up and given him the name that's above every other name. We, we clamor for position and power. We fear giving surrender in all when in actual fact, it's always the intention of Jesus to give us an inheritance and a kingdom. You see, I want to know what it means when Jesus says, in my father's house there are many rooms. Because the only room I know about at the moment is a cosmos. Billions of galaxies in it. So what does it mean for the Father to give you a room? If the room we know about is called the cosmos. In my Father's house there are many rooms. There's an old story about a man called Desert Pete. I use this in the Alpha course, but I'll tell you today. And in that story, a man goes hiking. And he is in the... Arizona desert and he's one, one, on one of the trails he runs out of water and he comes to an old mining town that's abandoned and in that mining town there's a hand pump and tied to the hand pump is an old tin and in the tin is a letter and the letter says this this is Desert Pete um, this well has never run dry but in order to use it you need to go under that rock find the water pour it down the hole to wet the leather sucker washer don't put half of it down, pour all of the water down the hole. If you will do that, then the water that you draw will never run dry. Just make sure you fill up the bottle and leave it for the next guy. Ooh. What would you do? There you are, you now have your hands on one lovely, cool bottle of water that's been buried under a rock. You have no water but this. And some guy 
in a letter is telling you, take that water and pour it away. And if you do, then your water will never run out. What would you do? Would you have a little sip? But all of that water is required to prime the pump. And the question for us is, you know, Jesus, will I pour out all of my life? Will I try and hold some back? But if I do, I'll keep it into eternity. And so when I read this story here, this isn't about, you know, just, wow, let's, let's give our money, let's give our possessions. I, you can have my watch, you can have my coat. This is about following the one who has gone ahead of us as the rich young ruler who has left his, his wealth and his kingdom and the, and the glory of the angels to find you and me. So I want to be compelled by that love. I want to emulate that love. I want to be like that Jesus, that one that we find in here. I want to be like the father who breaks open the alabaster jar, who takes the very best of his house, no matter what it looks like, and he gives his one and his only son, take your one and only son, is what he said to Abraham. You know, you can, you can hear the reflection of the father in that, in that verse, can't you, in Genesis. Take your son your only son. And the father gives his best. He did all that he could. Jesus comes here and he gives all that he has for the sake of you and I. There's a woman in the scriptures. There are only two examples of good discipleship in Mark's gospel. The first one is the alabaster jar. The second one is the two pennies. And the wording of both is almost identical. It says of the woman, the widow, she gave everything she had. It says of the alabaster jar, she did all she could. Jesus, show us that love. Pour that love into our hearts. Take out my stony heart and give me that heart that belongs to you. I need your heart. My heart's not big enough. My heart won't reach for those things. My heart's afraid and runs away from that. But if I have your heart, I don't mind getting ripped off. Because I can't be ripped off more than you could ever give me. You can outgive anybody trying to rip me off. You can give more than they could take. And so what happens in this story is I become part of that story with Jesus. I'm in it with him, but he's a rich young ruler. And the reason that's recorded is that we are going to have a second crack at it. The first person in that story didn't realize the moment they were in and so Mark writes it down so we can realize you can learn from the mistakes of that story the third and final one is you know when I'm thinking about God's love love the Lord your God with all your heart God's love is the love of the father that we see in the alabaster jar the love of the son the rich young ruler and the widow's coins it's the love of the Holy Spirit and it's a little bit of a weird story, a bit of a weird take on it. Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels are with him, ooh, <laughs> want to see that one? Are you ready for that? Are you ready? If Jesus were to come today, are you ready? Are you, do you feel okay about standing before the judgment seat of Christ? Has the love of Christ and the love of the Father got into your soul enough where you see the judgment seat of Christ as a good thing, not a bad thing? A few, few quiz, quizzical faces now going, I'm not sure about that one. You see, perfect love that I'm describing to you casts out fear. There's no fear of judgment in the love of Christ. I am redeemed by a savior whose blood is sufficient for me. The covenant that he has made will never be rescinded. I am irrevocably saved. You can have a different gospel if you want, but that's my gospel. That's the Jesus I know in this book. So I come to that story where the angels are gonna crash in with Jesus, now seen as who he is, the ruler of everything, the owner of everything, the son of man who is given glory and honor, Daniel 7. That Jesus comes and he sits, we are told, on his glorious throne, Matthew 25. Before him will be gathered the nations. Every person will be judged by Christ, like it or not. 
Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess Jesus is Lord. And he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And I had to look it up again. You know, if you look at Middle Eastern sheep and goats, they look quite similar apart from long ears on the sheep. Sheep listen better than goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. There was always a kingdom for you. There was always an intention to save you. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison. And you came to me. And the righteous will answer, Lord, when, when, when did we do this? When were you hungry or thirsty or naked? When did we see you as a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, truly, this is amazing. I say to you, when you did it for the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. So one of the highlights of my journey as a leader was going to, from Pemba down to um, Maputo and going with the guys to the Bokaria. And um, I was kindly given a two liter bottle of refrigerated water. That's a treasure in Mozambique, let me tell you. For me, it was a treasure. Cold water is a treasure. It's a thing of value. And so I had this two liter bottle and I tucked it in my backpack and we went and we visited and we loved people and we greeted them and brought a greeting from the United Kingdom and told them that we were thinking of them and, you know, sharing in their story. And we met a guy on top of the Bokaria, a 70 year old man, very thin man living in his house, which was a tarp and four sticks. And I said to him, is there anything I could do for you? And he said, I would just like a drink of water, please. And God had sent me from England to pull out of my backpack a cold two-liter bottle of water to hand to him. Now, here's the deal, and I get wrecked when I think about this. Jesus showed up in that man to receive the offering. Everything we do comes down to this. It's for you, Jesus. You have shown me love. I now have a revelation of the Father's love because the Father gave me everything he had when he sent you to give me, a dying, thirsty man, water. And now I get to do the very same to somebody else. And as I give that water to them, I know the Spirit of God comes into that man to receive the offering. I know it's true because Jesus says it's true. When you did it for the least of these, my brothers, you did it for me. He, he came into that scene. He's omniscient. He knows everything. He's omnipresent. He is present everywhere. He is present with that man. And as you give the water, as you stop for the one in front of you, as you spend time with that person nobody else will speak to, as you give place to the one that scares everybody because they've got mental health problems or they're a little bit smelly or they've got a drug issue or you know they're, they're on the game and doing things they shouldn't be doing, you know, go and sit with them, hear their stories. Jesus wants us to minister to the poor of our communities. He wants us to start there. He wants us to do it not out of a religious duty, but out of a wrecked heart. It's what we do. It's, it's all we do in Blackpool. It's all I've ever been doing because I was so undone by this guy that I found and fell in love with. He is, he is my captain and my king. I will follow him anywhere. He's the, the skipper on my lifeboat. I was going to show you some pictures of the lifeboat I used to be on and tell you that, you know, church is like a lifeboat and we should be out saving people. Just throw one of the pictures up, will you? And I'm going to land the plane now, guys. Heidi's seen this boat. She's been to this boat. She had a look around it. The church is a lifeboat. And there are different lifeboats 
for uh, different parts of the United Kingdom. My lifeboat for, my, for where I live is made to be launched off a beach where the tide goes out two miles. And, you know, down in Cornwall, they don't need that. So they have different lifeboats. If you just flick onto another one, they have these in Morecambe because the tide comes in and the water's about three inches deep for a mile. And so the only way they can rescue people stuck in the mud who are going to drown is by sending a, a hovercraft. So your rescue mission won't look the same as my rescue mission, but you are called into rescue. You are called into search and rescue. You are called to train. You are called to give yourself to it. These things are paid for by volunteers. There's no government funding for lifeboats. They are not crewed by people from the Navy or from the Coast Guard. There's people like Baptist ministers and lawyers and, and car mechanics and people who butchers and all kinds of things on our lifeboat, guys who work in the RAF. All of those people come together because the call goes out, the pager rings, and we assemble because we know what our mission is, and it's to save lives at sea. We are called to save nations. We are called to go into cities and into places where there's absolute poverty. But let me end with this. You know, my poverty is not your poverty. I have people whose children go hungry every day. We feed them because the ch mum and dad or mum is, is, is stoned and won't feed her children that day or will give them something to keep them quiet. So we feed the children. And that way mum doesn't commit suicide. And again, high suicide rates in Blackpool. They, they pulled down the tower blocks because too many people were jumping off them. And, and so, and they, they've, they've put um, paneling around the bus station. The next highest building in Blackpool is the, is the bus station in Blackpool because every week someone was jumping off, off the bus station. People jumping off the end of the piers when the tide's gone out because it's a 40-foot drop. That's our poverty in Blackpool. Moved to my other campus four miles away in Lytham St. Anne's where we build Eurofighters and, and we have the Royal Lytham Golf Club and a highest, one of the highest incidences of millionaires. And it's a different poverty. It's just a different kind of poverty, poverty of identity. And when they retire to Lytham St. Anne's, which is like Chorleywood by the sea or Bath by the sea, you know, th this is it. We've worked all our lives. We've filled our barns. And darling, I have something to tell you. I've got cancer. And I've got three months to live. And now you have a couple whose dream was to work, 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 move to the seaside to retire. And suddenly, that couple who've been together for 30 years, one of them's gone. That's another kind of a poverty. Poverty of community. Loneliness is, is agonizing. It's an agony of the soul to be lonely and to be alone. And the good news of Jesus Christ says, I will set you in a family. And people from all these different kinds of poverties, your poverties will be different to mine, are going to be helped and saved and reached and brought safely to shore when you get yourself absolutely ruined by this love that would break open the body of Christ and allow him to be poured out that his fragrance and the love of heaven would fill the earth. And this love that the Holy Spirit shows to you when you come in with him and you serve in the way Jesus has told you and you know that was a God moment. That was a God moment. I met that person. Let me tell you one, just one more God moment. And we, <laughs> there's so many. We see people saved every week, but there are so many. Some of our guys from one of our community kitchens, we have three soup kitchens in Blackpool that we run or are involved in. And they were out walking along the promenade and they saw a heavily pregnant woman running into the sea. And Basically, let me tell you as a lifeboatman, if you fall in the sea in Blackpool, you are going to drown unless there's a miracle. The sea is cold, the waters are confused, the surf will take you, you will drown. And she's running down the slade into the water and they stopped her and pulled her back. And what are you doing? What's going on? 
She was pregnant because she'd been in an affair with a man who, when he found out she was pregnant, left her to her own devices. And she had no hope. And so the only thing she could think to do now was to go and kill herself and kill her baby. But in that moment, God broke in and saved that woman, not just physically, but they spoke words of life into her. She received Christ in the moment and hope came to her. There are so many of those stories waiting to happen where you live. But you must go to the secret place. You must find this Jesus. You must allow the Holy Spirit to wreck you. Paul says this in Ephesians 3, I am on my knees praying to the Father from whom every family under heaven derives its name. That through the power of the Holy Spirit, you may receive power together with all the saints to know this love and be rooted and established in it and to know the height, the depth, the length and the breadth of the love of Christ that, he, that is for you. And as we have the encounters, love is the only thing that will change you. And I, I pray today for you guys, you know, so to answer the question when the Irish team came to Blackpool and said, why are you like this? Why are you like this? It was because I met him. And I keep finding him and I keep seeing him. And when I look at people, I see him in them. And I just get to reach in and pull him out. Like Barnabas who saw Saul as a, as a, a mighty apostle. Guys, that's what we're called to. And what I've said today really is just simple stuff. I've shown you how God reveals his love in the scriptures. I've shown you how that fuels a whole ministry in Blackpool. And we were in a church in London that we absolutely loved. And we absolutely delighted in the works of the Holy Spirit that were taking place in that, in that church in southwest London. And at one point, 2002, I laugh because Sam, <laughs> Sam's here and he, he wasn't expecting to be leading the church. But God said, I want this there. And I want you to spend the rest of today falling into the arms of Jesus. And I guarantee sooner or later he's going to say, I want this there. Take this. Take this encounter and multiply it. Multiply this bread. Give it away somewhere else. Take what you're receiving now and thrust it into your community. I want this there. And all I've done is spent my Christian life hearing Jesus say, I want this there. When we moved from London to Blackpool, people were ringing me up saying, don't do it, don't go, don't do that. And I had a friend who'd not seen me for years who said, I had a dream about you last night and you were going to the Arctic. <laughs> and I hadn't, he lives in the Cotswolds, I hadn't seen him since Bible college. And I said, that's really weird, why did you say that? And he said, well, it was this cold, cold, you know, tundra place and it was freezing and I was begging you not to go and eventually you got angry with me and he knew nothing about the call to Blackpool and Lytham and, you, and I said to him in the dream that he'd had stop saying that I've got to go I had other people saying don't go it's the graveyard of pastors nothing grows in the north of England music to my ears you know, I want to go and put it where it isn't. And I want to impart to you today such a love that you would have the same heart of Jesus, the same heart of heaven, the Father who said, I want to put this there. He, he wanted heaven on earth. He wanted the love and the joy of the angels surrounding the throne to be the love and the joy of the new community around the cross on earth. And I know that God has a purpose for each of us being here. And if it's only this, Father, give me an impartation like Jesus that I could take this and put it there. Someone say amen. Preacher will stop.